Today is a somber day for the baseball community as we lost a great. Willie Mays, the Say Hey Kid, unfortunately passed away at 93 years old in Palo Alto, California. It's not fun to do reports on things like these. I was never able to meet this legend and a lot of people probably wish they could have. He's someone we'll never forget, someone who played in the Negro Leagues back when they were still around and made the transition over while also playing in one of the most diverse and extremely hard baseball stadiums to ever play. And he did it and made it look easy. He's incredible and we'll never forget you. Let's get into today's video. Welcome back to Touching Bases Podcast, and unfortunately, it is a lot of bad news today. Um, I understand that, like, Willie, Willie Mays was old. We, we, we all understand that. He was 93 years old, and, you know, unfortunately, these heroes that we look up to in the baseball community, they're not superhuman. They don't live forever. They're not immortal. But in the last few years, we seem to be losing a lot of them, especially during that great era, and I just kind of want to reflect on it. I, I the lot To those of you that had the opportunity of actually meeting Willie Mays in person and seeing what role he played in the major leagues, even outside of being on the field, whether it's organization or when he retired, I, I, I envy you. And then I also hope that those memories that you had are cherished and held on forever. In 1948, Willie Mays was 17 years old and was drafted to play in the Negro Leagues for the Birmingham Black Barons, a very famous team that everybody kind of knows nowadays. They did win the NAL Championship Series going 4-3-1 and one against the Kansas City Monarchs. Um, unfortunately, they lost the World Series 4-1 to one against the Homestead Grays, a very famous team in history. After that season, he did get drafted by Major League Baseball in 1948. 51 at age 20 by the New York Giants. He won Rookie of the Year that season, followed up by multiple All-Star appearances ranging from 1954 all the way to 1972 every single year, winning the MVP two times and then coming up in the voting 19 times as well following that season. It's hard to decide what year was his best year playing in the MLB. In 1955, he hit 51 home runs and had an OPS of 1.059 with a OPS plus of 174. He hit 319, which was significantly less than the year before where he ended his season with a 345 batting average. But looking at 1965, nearly 10 years later, he hit 50 two home runs, batting a 317, almost identical to 1955, and he had an OPS of 1.043. His OPS plus that season was the highest though in 1965, where he had a 185 OPS, which is very much in line with what Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle were putting up in the early 40s. He did win MVP in 1965, so I would say that's probably his most memorable season, and that was years and years into his career after winning the Rookie of the Year. As far as sustainability and players, this is the reason why he is a legend and will never be forgotten about. He started in New York with the Giants. Of course, they transferred over to San Francisco where he was there for almost his entire career until 1972 when he got traded to New York Mets. For those that watch this, if anybody in his family ever were to see this or any friends were able to see this video or watch this channel, my condolences to you. We lost someone special and I can only imagine how hard your loss is. Rest in peace. Moving on to the rest of the league that's going on. Again, not a lot of good information. Kyle Brash had his Tommy John surgery today, which means that he's out for the rest of the season. Orioles now are probably going to be looking for an arm, which adds them to the trading talks of Garrett Crochet. Probably on the hot list to be to be traded off because of how well he's playing now. It's his first season. There's not a lot of history with him to prove that this is something he can sustain, but I'm pretty sure the White Sox, just given the record that they're at right now, would love to liquidate him off for a bunch of prospects so they can maybe make a run in 2027. But that's still up in the air, but now I would say that the Orioles are a buyer. And coming up on the trade deadline soon, we'll have to see. Moving over to the Yankees, some good news and bad news, I guess. Anthony Rizzo is put on the 60-day DL. Unfortunately, he hit himself trying to run out a ground ball earlier this week, and they have officially said he's going to be out for a while. So 60-day IL for Anthony Rizzo. But the good news is Garrett Cole is back. Now, he's going to be limited to 85 pitches this game, and he is pitching today when I get this video out. We'll see how that works out and how good he does. This is He has been extremely good in his rehab assignment. I believe he's pitching under a one ERA. I think he's at 0.83 and he's had multiple strikeouts and I don't think he's given up a single walk while he's doing his rehab assignment. So he's still elite and he's living up to his $300 million contract. We just hope that he can stay healthy as we move forward. At least Yankee fans are. If you're a Red Sox fan, I'm sorry, but he's back. On a side note, this is just uh, someone to look forward to. As we, we lose life and we remember those who were the greats, we should look forward to those who are going to be great or possibly could be great. 
And someone I wanted to highlight is Rintaro Sasaki. He's coming over from Japan as a high schooler, and he's now admitted to Stanford University, where he's going to be playing next season for them. If you haven't heard of Rintaro Sasaki, he is probably going to be one of the biggest powerhouses going into the draft in the MLB when he becomes of age. He is currently a senior in high school, but if I read off his stats, Sasaki hit a Japanese high school record, 140 home runs, and was projected to be the first selected overall in the Nippo, in the MPB draft, but instead, he decided to go to Stanford University in Oregon and possibly open up his chance to join the MLB. So this is a player that you should absolutely keep an eye on. So if the name sounds familiar, Rintaro Sasaki is the son of Hiroshi Sasaki, who is also the former coach that got, you guessed it, Shohei Otani to where he's at so if the son of one of the greatest coaches in Japanese baseball currently is bringing his son over to the United States you should be pretty excited he also holds an impressive slash line at least this is high school I understand this is very low compared to what we're gonna see over in the bigs but if he can develop to sustain this type of level of talent and he doesn't plateau it's gonna be crazy a 413, 514, and an 808 slash lines for high school in Japan. And now he's coming over to play college ball. So keep an eye on him. He might be someone worth a lot of money later on. That's all I have for you guys. It's a nice quick video. Now, I want to let you guys know that I have a long form video going on tomorrow that's going to be up. I'm editing it right now, and it's a very long one. We're talking about the trades that the Mariners, the Seattle Mariners could make given the prospects that they have and what they need. i very set on the fact that they need two bats. I think they'll only go for one. I think that they should, and the ideal thing would be getting three bats. And I go over everybody that could be an option and who we should probably avoid just because it doesn't make sense for our future. And hopefully you can tune into that. I'm going to finish editing that. I'm going to edit this one, get it out to you guys. And until then, have a fantastic day. See you.